I will awaken the dawn as my prayer ascends to you. Well, it's been a joy to be with you this week, and I, <clears throat> I really trust that the Word has fallen on good soil. And uh, if it has, it'll bring forth good fruit. And that's what we're looking for and what we're about and what we hope for. So on Wednesday, we started off in Isaiah 64, and we spoke about the presence of God, the need of it, the power of God, the need of it, and the people of God responding to God as God speaks. And on Thursday, we're in Proverbs 24 about the sluggard and how we looked at the man and how he had let his field go, and we saw the character of the man. We saw the condition of the field, and we saw the consideration of Solomon that he discerned that this man was a man with a wasted life. And I will tell you this, you can come to the end of your day and you may not think it's wasted, but the Father may. And the thing is, we cannot allow that to happen and the only way we can keep from it is to do what we talked about on Friday night in dealing with the fact that God has dealt with us bountifully. Knowing that, we can walk in Him because of His great redemption, because of His great forgiveness, because He has enabled us to be a part of His great kingdom, because He has forgiven us. He has done so many wonderful things in our life that we should live bountifully. And that's what David said. He was in despair, then he went to prayer, and then he went to joy. And there's not one reason today, hear me clearly when I say what I'm going to say, there is not one reason today of anything going on in your life where there should not be the joy of the Lord. Because our joy is not based on happenings. Happiness is. Joy is based on the Lord Jesus Christ. Who He is and what He's doing in your life. And then last night, we dealt with the concept of the Spirit-filled life and the need of that. Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, that is dissipation, that is wastefulness, says the Scripture. But we're to be filled to full and walk in the Lord. We talked about the need to walk in the Lord. We talked about not to walk by the flesh, but to walk in the Spirit. And the only way we can do that is by being filled with the Spirit. So when we come with all of that, we talk about then the need to stand on the gospel and the need to speak the gospel. So today we come to Matthew 28. With all of this in mind, with all God has spoken to us, the question this morning is, what do we do with what we've heard? Do not be merely hearers of the word only, but be doers of the word. So this morning, I'm going to challenge you to be a doer of the word. I trust that my challenge will not do near what the child of the Lord will do. Matthew 28. Scripture says in Matthew 28, but the 11 disciples proceeded to Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had designated. Stop right there. What did they do? The 11 disciples proceeded to the mountain to where Jesus had done what? Designated. They didn't go to the mountain they wanted to go to. They went to the mountain God commanded him to go to. Just like Abraham did when he took his son up Mount Moriah, he didn't go to the mountain he wanted to go to. He went to the mountain God had designated for such an eventful situation as the sacrifice of his son. What God is looking for is a group of people who will decide that they're going to be obedient to God and whatever God asks them to do, they will do. Not only that, they will do what he has already, already commanded us to do. And there's many things in Scripture that He has commanded us to do. Matter of fact, we know probably, if we're honest, a whole lot more than what we're living. Amen. We know that we're to love our wife as Christ loved the church, men. Women, we know that we're to be submissive. Whoa, wait a minute, Brother Ed. This is the 21st century. Culture changes. Scripture does not. Amen. Children to be obedient to their parents. We're to be givers. We're to be disciple makers. We're to be in prayer. We're to be studying the Word. We're not to forsake our assembling together. 
We're to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. All of these things are just a, just a little thumbnail sketch of what we know that we're supposed to be doing. The primary thing that we're to be doing is found in our text this morning. And look what he says in verse 17. And when they saw him, they went to where God had told them to go, where Christ had told them to go. And when they saw him, they did what? They worshiped him. Now listen very carefully. It's very difficult to worship God on Sunday when you've been being disobedient Monday through Saturday. You cannot do it. See, a lot of times what we do when we show up for church, we show up for church thinking God ought to show up because we've shown up. He's not going to do that. He's going to show up when we anticipate him showing up and expecting him showing up and we believe he should show up because we have lived in honor of him for that week and we've come prepared in our heart, mind, soul, and spirit to meet with God on Sunday morning. When a great meal is prepared, it takes time. And people come to eat and they eat of that meal. And when they do, it benefits their body. And the Word of God benefits your soul. It is not, please hear me, it is not for hearing only. How many sermons have you heard in your life? More than one. What are you doing with them? That's the question. That's why I challenge you. If you're not taking notes, you need to take notes. You need to write some things down. John MacArthur says the average Christian come to church on Sunday morning to get their cup filled. They bring a thimble and they spill it before they get to the car. Now that's what humorous, but it's pitifully true. Amen. Will you remember? We're going to be very honest this morning. We're very blunt this morning. Will you remember this message? When you get to your car. That's the challenge. So I trust this morning. You may jot a few things down. God does not mind you writing in your Bible. Matter of fact that's why you have blank pages in the back. And that's why I carry a wide margin. So you can. I'm encouraging you, not demeaning you. Because what I know is the more time you spend in the Word and the more time you come with anticipation of God working, it is a, it is, it is a benefit to your soul. Psalm 62, 5 says, My soul waits upon the Lord. My expectation is from Him. So when we come this morning, do we come to worship? We have come to the place, now shall we worship. What does the worship mean? It means to bow the knee. It means to bow the heart. It means to give your mind. It means to concentrate on the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has done. We're not thinking about the hamburgers we're going to have at lunch. We're not thinking about the Dallas Cowboys this afternoon. Where mind is set on the things above, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, and not on the things of this earth. That's when worship happens. But you don't have to be here to worship. Amen. You can worship anywhere. There was a man years ago who uh, traveled the country playing his saxophone named Bernard uh, Jackson. Man, he could play that thing. And I had a tape of his. And remember the eight tracks? Some of you do. And they had a deal that you could stick in the eight track where you could play a cassette. Remember those? Well, I had a, 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 a tape of Bernard, uh, Johnson, Bernard Johnson. And I'm coming over the bridge in Houston, the Port Bridge, huge bridge over. And he's playing the sax. Don't have my eyes closed. I'm smarter than that. But I am worshiping in my car. You can worship in the cab of a Freightliner or an International Transtar. How do I know that? Because I used to drive them when I was in evangelism. I drove them when I was a younger man. You can worship anywhere you want to worship. It's a matter of choice. Matter of fact, everything about the Christian life is a matter of choice. God is not going to make you do anything. Now let's look what he says here. He says in verse 19, in, Jesus, in verse 18, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Authority over heaven and on earth. It's a, the resources of heaven, the resources of earth are mine. And I have authority 
over you? Have you submitted this morning to the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you submitted to him? It is a daily thing. You must submit daily. How do you have victory over the devil, over Satan? How do you have victory? It's not necessarily about rebuking him because you don't have the authority to do that. How do you do that? James chapter 4 and verse 7 says you submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. But if you're not submitted to God, you can do all the rebuking you want to do and he's not going anywhere. Remember what I told you earlier in the week, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, your adversary Satan is as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. It doesn't say he is a roaring lion. It says he is as a roaring lion. Always understand the significance of preposition and verbs in the Greek language. It makes a huge difference in what the scripture really says. Okay? Now, look at it. It's been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore. And by the way, just for the record, I want to teach you something right here. That just has nothing to do with the concept that's said so many times, as you are going. As you are going indicates you may not go. This is an imperative command. As you are going, make disciples. Not, not as you're going, but what does he say? Go. It's an imperative. Go, therefore, and make disciples. I've, what, what, what's it mean about the authority? He said, I've given you the authority to make disciples. I've given you the ability to make disciples. That's what we're here for. That's why we walk in the Spirit. That's why we tend the field of our life. That's why we want the presence and the power of God on our life where we can make disciples. That is our purpose in being left here. Reaching someone for Christ and evangelism to me is, 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 is kind of as simple as it gets. But when the hard work comes, it's when we begin to mentor them and disciple them and grow them and see them come to be a discipler. That's the work. That's the hard work. And I asked you early in the week and made comment about leading someone to Christ. Now, if you have not, I am not judging you. I am challenging you to move that concept to the front burner of your life. That in the year before this year's out, you're going to share the gospel with someone. They may not come to know Christ, but you're going to share the gospel with them. Why do I say that? Because that is your responsibility. Under God, it is your responsibility to do that. Jack Galbraith walked into my life one day. Jack Galbraith was about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, weighed about 260 pounds. He was from Brooklyn, New York. His wife came to my church and her two teenage daughters. and I visited with her after church and I said, can I come by and visit you? Jerry said to me, that probably would not be good. And I said, why not? And she said, well, my husband doesn't like preachers. And I said, well, I can identify with that. I got a few I don't like. Can I come by? She said, yes, but I need to tell you, he has literally thrown two pastors out bodily. I said, I'll risk it. I'll risk it. So I went by, pulled up in front of his house. The wise man I was, I prayed. That I would not be number three. Walked up the door, knocked on the door. Jerry invited me in. She said, Jack, the pastor's here. He came around the corner. He had on one of those white tank undershirts like my daddy used to wear and a pair of khakis and barefooted. He's a mountain of a man. I'm not little, but he's a mountain of a man. And number one thing I ha <clears throat> have on most people is hand size. And Jack came across that floor with his hand out, and I knew what he was going to try to do. He wanted to hurt me. He wanted to see if he could hurt me. And I got my hand in there as far as I could get it, and I gave him everything I had, and we shook hands like this, not like this, but like this. And he looked me in the eye the whole time we were shaking hands. I never said a word to him. When we got through, he said, would you like to sit down? Absolutely, I would. If I didn't want to sit down, I would have sat down. He said, we want something to drink. And I've told people, if he had said, do you want a beer? I'd have probably said, that'd be fine. <laughs> I was not going to be in argument with this man. He said, how about a glass of tea? I said, that's fine. We sat there and we talked. We visited. 
He found out that I grew up in the oil fields of West Texas. He found out I'd been in the military. He found out that I had been where men have been that think they're men. You'll get that in a minute. Never said a word to him about the church. Never said a word to him about the Lord. It was not the time. Got up, walked out. He said, thank you for coming. I said, look forward to seeing you someday, Jack. Walked out the door. Two weeks later, guess who's at church? Jack Galbraith. I didn't go to him, tell him you need to make a decision for Christ. I didn't do anything. Third week, Jack's there. Fourth week, Jack's there. About six weeks, he's been coming. We had a little youth house out back of our church over in Grand Prairie, and I went in there to light the heaters one night. And when I came out from lighting the heaters, I saw a shadow of someone stepping up on the porch. And I turned and looked, and it was Jack Galbraith. And he said in that Brooklyn accent, Preacher, you got a minute? I said, I got all the time you want, Jack. What could I do for you? He said, I'm going to ask you a question. And then I'm going to tell you something. I said, okay. He said, I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I said, I know that. He said, but what you don't know is there's not one thing out of sight of murder I have not done. Can God save me? That was his question. And I said, Jack, that's not the question. He said, what's the question? I said, do you want him to? That's the question. He said, why? And it was about 22 degrees, sleeting right down, cold as everything. And he said, in that Brooklyn, why do you think I'm standing here freezing to death? And I said, well, Jack, you, you've received Christ. You pray and ask him to come into your life. And he did. And I baptized Jack God breath. Never missed a Sunday the rest of the time I was there. Never will forget Jack God breath. Jack God breath with the Lord today. When I get to heaven, I'll see Jack God breath. And others. But there's some just stand out. And so my whole point of life is this. When God called me to preach, he called me to go and make disciples. It begins with evangelism. He says, go therefore and make disciples. And of all the nations, baptizing them. All the languages is that word nation. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The only imperative there is make disciples. The other two words to baptize and to teach are not. They're participles. They're not imperatives. But yet when you lead someone to Christ, there's a responsibility. Not to just let them go and, and let them flounder in life, but to take them and help them become grounded in the truth that they might walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That is making disciples. It is spending time with them. When I pastored Woodlake Baptist Church for 12 years, I met with men. I didn't meet with women. I met with men. And I would meet with them. If you wanted to meet with me, you met with me at 6 o'clock in the morning. I had guys say, that's a little early, isn't it? I said, not for me. You want this or not, that's really what it comes down to. One day a guy named Chuck Roaming had come to our church and joined the church, said he was saved. About six weeks later, he got saved. About three months later, I could tell Jack was growing and learning and seeking. And I said, hey, I mean, uh, uh, Chuck, I said, hey, Chuck, I said, uh, want to meet me for some breakfast in the Tuesday morning? Where at? I said, Mom's Cafe. He said, sure. Six o'clock, he's there. Six o'clock, I'm there. We visit, we talk, share, visit. This goes on for about four or five weeks. I've got him reading a book. We're in Proverbs together. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, are you discipling me? I said, that's a general idea. He said, that's what my wife said. See, discipleship takes time. It's an investment in the lives of people. Listen, I don't know where you are in your journey. I don't know where you would categorize yourself in your spiritual life on a scale 1 to 10. It really doesn't matter. There is someone that needs you to invest your time in their life for the glory of God. You have something they can learn from you. Everyone in this room, you know enough to share with someone the truth of God's Word. The bottom line is, what has God done in your life that you can share with someone else that God can do the same thing in their life? That's the issue. Mentoring. 
mentoring. We can't seal ourselves off from the world. We can't seal ourselves off from fellow Christians. We need to spend time. And I want to say to you again, it is not your pastor's job to do all the evangelizing. It is not your pastor's job to do all the discipleship. It is a team effort or it will not happen. So, we're here to make disciples. We're walking in the Spirit, not making disciples. Maybe we're not walking in the Spirit. Amen. We need to cultivate lives. Cultivate them. One of the greatest places of discipleship begins where you can make investment is in your home with your children and your family. But don't let it stop there. I never will forget, my daughter went through a long time before she could have babies. She had four miscarriages. We lost seven babies in that time. And now God has given me wonderful twin granddaughters that are be 13 years old in January. And when they were about three and a half or four years old, I called one day and they were out in the front yard and Holly had her phone and, and she said, Ashley wants to talk to you. And I said, okay. And they called me G-Dad. And Ashley gets on the phone. She said, G-Dad. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you want to pray? I said, I sure do, Ashley. She said, I'll pray. I said, okay. And she prayed. She got through and she said, G dad. And they always, everything they, every, every time a kid, they got to preface your name, what they call you, right? She said again, G dad. I said, what baby girl? She said, you want to pray? I said, yes, ma'am. I sure do. And now they've come to know the Lord. Your parents have taken them through the Bible. One complete time, reading it, short deals at a time to where they can get it. Now they're up to where they can do at least a chapter or two and they're going through it again. We talk about spiritual things. When I take those young ladies to get yogurt after school, I ask them questions about their life. What are you learning? What is God teaching you? What's the last verse you memorized? Folks, I'm saying one thing. The further I get in the journey, the more serious I need to be about it. This is not a one-day activity during the week. A lot of people say, Jesus doesn't want to be your Savior. He wants to be your Lord, and that is true. I'm going to take it one step further he wants to be your life. He wants to be your life. Church is not show and tell. God looks on the heart. Amen. Look what he says. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them. This word teaching is a participle and it means it's really in the present tense. And it means an ongoing process. You continue to teach. You continue to teach. So important that we had, as I shared with you the other night, that we have teaching in the church. Doctrine is essential. Teaching them observe all I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Stop right there. Now we use that term a lot. I'm with you always. But let me ask you a question. What is he with you for? Making disciples. He comes alongside of you. And if you're willing to invest the time in someone, he will meet with you and with them. Find somebody. It may be a teenage friend. It may be a lady across the street. But you begin to spend time with them and invest with them. You don't even have to introduce yourself and let them know that what you're trying to do, it will grow on them and they'll begin to like it, especially when you put out the Word of God and begin to share with them and share with them, first of all, your testimony about what the Lord Jesus Christ has done in your life. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what does he say we're to do? We're to make disciples. That's the point today. There's not three points in a poem today. There are three, one point. Make disciples. Make disciples. Go and make. Imperative command. Imperative command. What does that mean? It's not a suggestion. Now look, if you would, at 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll see how Paul emphasized this with his young protege, Timothy. And he says in verse 1 of chapter 2, you therefore my son. Now, that's his spiritual son. That's not his 
He's not the father physically to Timothy. He's his spiritual son. He has led him to the Lord. He has mentored him. He has discipled him. He said, be strong. Be strong. That's something you have to do. God's not going to be strong for you. He will be your strength, but you've got to yield to him being strong for you. It's a passive voice that I spoke of last night. It means strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He is the one who gives us strength, but we have to yield to him that the strength might be in us to do what we need to do. God gives you what you need at the moment in time that you need it. you understand that? I'll give you a prime example. 1978, Easter of, my dad who adopted me and gave me his name because my real dad abandoned me, fell in the bathroom as he reached to dry his hands, he let go of his walker, fell, hit his head on the base of the wall and died. I preached his funeral. I didn't do that in my strength. Because five minutes before the service, I could have given you no guarantee I could have done it. But God gave me what I needed at the moment. I preached my mother-in-law's funeral on a very interesting day. It will day you will remember. It was 911. And I preached my mother-in-law's funeral on that day, three hours after the strike in New York City. Place was packed. She had lived in Wood County all of her life, probably six or seven hundred people there, and the Lord brought down glory and the gospel. There were people leaving there talking to others saying, I believe I need to get right with God. There's no time like the present. Amen? No time like the present. Look what he says. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me. Timothy, what I have taught you, what I have taught you by the word of God, what I've taught you in the presence of many witnesses, these you, Timothy, entrust to faithful men who will be able then to teach others also. See, it is a ripple effect. Get involved in someone's life to the glory of God. Do you really believe that when a person comes to know Christ and they re repent of their sin and he becomes their Savior that they really have a home in heaven and they have eternal life and they're going to miss hell and make glory? Do you really believe that? Then tell someone. Tell someone. If it's real to you, Tell someone. If it's real to you, speak the truth to someone. If it's real to you, teach them the Word of God. If it's real to you, live it before them. If it's real to you, do something with it. Do something with it. God didn't save you to come to church to sit, soak, and sour. And I've met a bunch of soured Baptists in my time. And if we're walking in the Spirit, we won't be sour. And our lives will impact and infect other people. Now then, this is what we're to do. It's what Jesus says to disciples. It's what Paul says to Timothy. What prevents this? What keeps us from doing this? If you'd like, turn over to Ecclesiastes, if you would, please. Chapter 1. And in the first two verses of the passage, the preacher says this, Solomon, the same man that wrote Proverbs. He says, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What's he saying? My life has been the futility of, a futility is what he's saying. What he's saying is that nothing, it's vanity. It, 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 it's futile as used 37 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Just in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's life's unanswerable questions in incomprehensible knowledge that he has that he gives to us. And he says simply this, it's futile. If you go through the first two or three chapters, he'll say it's like grasping for the wind. You can't harness it. I grew up in West Texas. The wind blows all the time. 
And sometimes it just blows more than others. You can't harness it. Have you ever been to the ocean? Have you ever been to Gulf Shores, Alabama, or to Pensacola, Florida, and sat on the beach and, and watched the ocean come in? The power of it, the magnificence of it, the glory of it, because God created it, it cannot be harnessed. It cannot be grasped. And Solomon is saying, everything I have pursued in life is futility of futilities. It is nothing. It is not a, it is useless. It is without meaning, is what he's saying. And then he says something quite interesting, and we remind ourselves. He says in verse 14 of chapter 1, I have seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. It's foolishness, he says. Absolute foolishness. Verse 17, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I realize that this also is striving after the wind. If you just want knowledge for knowledge and you just want wisdom for wisdom, it's no good. It has to be to the glory of God that you want to have it and use it. Solomon had it all, didn't he? Solomon had the wine. Solomon had wealth. Solomon had the women. Concubines galore. And what does he say? Verse 11 of chapter 2, Then I considered all my activities, the things that I labored to do, which my hands had done in labor, which I exerted. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind, and there was no profit under the sun. It was fruitless. And then he says in verse 17 of chapter 2, So I hated life. My goodness. You've got all the money in the world. You've got all the, all the wealth in the world. You've got all the wine you want in the world. You've got everything you want in the world, all the women you want. And what does he say? It's useless. It's useless. So I had it life. For the work which has been done under the sun was grievous to me. Because everything is futile and striving after the wind. Thus I hated all the fruit of my labor for which I had labored under the sun. For I must leave it to the man who will come after me. Can I give you some news today? When you die, you're not going to take. Do you notice I said when you die, not if. When you die, you're not going to take one thing with you. Have you ever seen a U-Haul following a hearse? Huh? When my dad died, my dad never owned a home. When my dad died, I got a 22 rifle that my mother had bought for him for his birthday in 1956. I got a plug of white tag Tinsley chewing tobacco that had never been opened. I got a bird dog whistle, a pocket knife, and that was it. He didn't have anything. And the honest truth, nor do we. Nor do we. Life is going to end one day. My mother and my dad are buried at Kaufman, Texas. On both of their graves it says, born, my mother, born in 1922, died 2015. The date she was born is not significant. The date she died is not significant. It's the dash in between. What will we do? What will Ed Etheridge do? What will be said of him from 1946 to question mark? The one date is there. The other isn't. But I will tell you this. It's coming. It's appointed that a man wants to die. And then the judgment. Are you certain in your soul that if your life ended today that you would go be with the Lord? In verse 17, he vents his frustration because what's happened to Solomon is he knows better, but his flesh has gotten in control. He is not walking in the Spirit. He gathered it all. A lot of people have. 
But see, one of the greatest things that ever happened was John 3, 16, for when God so loved the world, then what did he do? What did he do? What did he do? He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. He gave. See, the concept of giving is not a bad thing. It all began at the cross. Aren't you glad? Huh? Where did God begin to teach you about giving? It happened to me in a post office in Grand Prairie, Texas, and I close with this. Walked into the post office one day, and back then, every day, I was going to Dallas Baptist University, and when I wasn't going to class, I was uh, dressed in a tie and a sport coat. That's what we did. And I walked into the post office, and I had some things to mail, and I went over and started putting my stamps on it. There's a fellow there that just right adjacent to me on the same table, and he was humming a gospel song. And I stopped and listened to him for a minute. I said, hey, brother. I said, I, I know your song. Are you a believer? He said, I certainly am. Are you? I said, yes, sir, I am. He handed me a card, and he was an independent Baptist evangelist from North Carolina. I could not tell you his name for anything, but I can tell you his nickname, Happy Jack, in parentheses on his card. And we visited for a little bit, and I started out, and he made comment about my jacket. He said, man, that is a sharp-looking sport coat. That is absolutely one of the best-looking sport coats I've ever seen. It had kind of a light green, dark green, little bronze line in it. Kind of looked like a used car salesman. I walked out to my car, and I had a little 67 Volkswagen, and I stuck the key in the door. I stuck the key in the door. The Lord spoke to my heart, not audibly. Louder than that. He said, give the man your jacket. And I said, but Lord, ever negotiate with God? Sure you do if you're honest. But Lord, I only have three and this is my wife's favorite. Give the man your coat. So I took the coat off. And I laid it across my arm, and I walked in the back into the post office. Happy Jack was still there. And he said, what are you doing? I thought you were gone. I said, well, I thought I was too. I need to ask you a question. He said, what's that? I said, did the Lord ever ask you to do something that absolutely you didn't understand? Kind of interrupted your day? An uncommon command? He said, well, yeah, a time or two. Why? And I said, I need to ask you another question. I said, what size jacket do you wear? I was hoping he would say a 36 short, <laughs> but he didn't. He said a 42 long. And at that time I wore a 42 long. I don't wear a 42 long now. I wear a 46 long. I said, well, he said, why do you ask? I said, because the Lord's impressed me to give you this coat. And he said, what? He said, are you serious? I said, never been more serious in my life. It's your coat. And he said, well, I've never had anything like this ever happen to me. I said, that makes two of us. <laughs> and I handed him the jacket. And right there is where the Lord began to teach me the truism. It's better to give than to receive. Because God gave his son, we can receive life. Giving is a way of life for the Christian. I'll tell you what I believe, okay? I believe that Christian people should be the most generous people in the world. And I can say all I want to say about this because the offering's already been taken. And you cannot accuse me. We should be the most generous people in the world. Amen. We should be the most generous because God was most generous with us. Periodically, I will go to a restaurant and there'll be a family there or some individual or whatever. And I said I was going to close with that. And I'm, I'm not. <laughs> I was sitting in the Denny's one day in Plano, Texas, years ago. 1991 or two. Drinking coffee, waiting on a guy. And the Lord impressed me to buy this family's meal. I did not know them. 
Didn't know anything about them. I just kind of discerned that they might be a little needy. And so I told the waitress, I said, would you do me a favor? She said, sure, what is it? And I said, would you bring me the check for those folks there? And she said, do you know them? I said, do I need to? And she said, this is most unusual. I said, yes, ma'am, it is. You don't have a clue. Because it was the first time I'd ever done that. She brought me the ticket and I paid for it. And periodically, that opportunity comes again. It's never something I manufacture. It's just something that I feel strongly about and know that I need to do that. We were in East Texas one night, family of six. We get through eating with my wife's brother-in-law and sister-in-law and her sister and her husband. And I'm standing there in the middle of the floor headed to the deal. And she said, Judy said, are you coming? I said, I'm thinking. She said, what are you thinking about? I said, I'm thinking if the Lord wants me to buy those folks over there's meal or not, I, I think so. And she said, do you think God really minds if you buy their supper? And I said, no, I don't think he'd mind. And she said, then buy it and come on. <laughs> Aren't you glad that we serve a God of generosity? Now, let me tell you something that that relates to. He has given you all you need if you're in Christ to make disciples. See, it's not all about having money and giving money. It's about giving my time, my talent, and my treasure to the glory of the Lord. Lord, all I have is yours. What do you want me to do with it? That's the question, amen? That's the question. God's given you a mind. God's given you a heart. God's given you his spirit. Use it to the praise of his glory. In no greater way can you use it than by making disciples and investing your life in someone else's to the praise of his glory. Who knows? If you're willing, another Jack Galbraith may walk into your life. And you have that glorious privilege of singing, come to know Christ.